All right. I'm here with Amaui Sache, the uh, who really you probably don't need much of an introduction, I think, for my audience. But needless to say, for anybody who's watching, the uh, benevolent dictator, founder of Bitcoin ABC, the uh, creator of Bitcoin Cash, uh, also the creator of eCash. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. People had been asking me, well, since since as students and other people who follow me have been watching me slowly move at first slowly it's like what what is it first slow then fast but it's like first slowly move in the direction of eCash uh, after the split in 2020 from Bitcoin Cash and then most recently say okay I'm just forget Bitcoin Cash I'm just moving all I'm going all in on eCash here with my development work and my businesses uh, they've been the thing that keeps coming up is this question about avalanche and yep. I wanted to do this because I don't have the answers. Like I have some technical answers about what Avalanche is, but what I don't have the answers for and what I was hoping that we could do today is really get into some of the why of why mm -hmm. these decisions are being made in terms of eCash. So in terms of consensus mechanisms, Avalanche, proof of work, all of that, there's a lot of technical information out there. I'm going to link to some videos that you have done where you've broken down sort of the, the what of this thing and how it works. There's been some recent interviews that you've done that were excellent that I think anybody who wants to dig into that can get into. Um, but, you know, you're one of the most, well, provably one of the most technically competent people in the space, no doubt. Um, but in addition to that, my experience with you has been you're probably the most competent person to talk about the game theory and the incentives and, and, and more of the psychological and the sociological aspect of why certain engineering decisions need to be made, right? So if that's cool, if we can kind of get this high level view so people can understand the why, uh, will that work for you? Yes. So... When you, when you asked me to talk about that, uh, ever since then, I've been thinking about how to present that because mm. it's, it's quite a difficult topic because the problem, the problem that is being solved is extremely abstract. And okay. so while it's fairly easy to present examples of things that, you know, it improved, they all look completely disconnected. Right. Um, and... And that makes it uh, quite difficult to convey like the, the very important point. But the most important point, like the, the thing that is at the root of it all is entropy. Um, okay. As in, so you have nodes on, on the Bitcoin network or really any cryptocurrency network and event happen on the network. And as things go, the state each node is in is going to drift. Right, because maybe my node is gonna see one transaction before the other, but your node sees the opposite, right? And at the beginning, they drift like little by little, but as time goes on, they drift more and more, right? And once in a while, you have a block that happens that act as a reconciliation point, effectively, right? That that stays well, you know, here is the event that you saw, but actually, here is the series of events that are in the block, and hopefully, they are similar but they may not be exactly the same right and so that's the timestamp. that's this is the timestamp that satoshi talks about in the white paper so we timestamp yeah. the state of the network every 10 minutes and then everybody agrees on that even if they've drifted yeah. over that 10 minutes or however long it is yeah and and so one of one of the core problem here is that there is no objective state Right, like the 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 event as they happen can happen in one order for me and in another order for you, and there is no way to tell right or wrong for that. And even if you want to get like deeply philosophical, or or you know, with Einstein theory of relativity uh, tells us that you know, even like even if we could get infinitely precise, effectively, like the, this ambiguity still exists, um, but. But we don't need to get as far as this, right? Like just because message take time to propagate on the network and, and you know, nothing is perfect, right? So information is lost here and there once in a while, something goes wrong, a machine crash or whatever, right? So, so the effect of that is that each node sees a different view of the world that may not be congruent with the one of the nodes. And... 
and so to to resolve that you need a consensus algorithm right and and bitcoin uses uh what is now called nakamoto consensus where you build a chain of blocks and the one that is the heaviest um is is going to be considered the one that is you know correct um by the one most that people. people have done the most work on that it took the most yeah. work to create is going to we say okay that's the chain we're going to roll with so i'm using heaviest here purposefully because i want to decouple the notion of proof of work from nakamoto consensus because it's not exactly the same um and and we've seen people do proof of all kind of things um and so one of the points that get the discussion very confused is that people they talk about like proof of work proof of stake and stuff like that but the discussion of nakamoto consensus and avalanche uh, happen on the like different plane effectively right um and and so i see a lot of people saying well you know this is combining the the this is combining the benefit of proof of work with proof of stake or stuff like that and and really that's the wrong way to look at it uh, usually when we mean proof of stake we mean nakamoto consensus but we measure the weight of the chain using stake right this is what this is what is usually made by by proof of stake system but avalanche is like not that at all it's 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 completely different. It's a different consensus algorithm. It doesn't so the, use so the discussion or this simplified, because I mean, we see this around. I think even if we look at it now on, if we go and look at eCash on coin market cap, it's got the little things up top of what's the consensus uh, mechanism. And it'll say proof of work, proof of stake hybrid. So this is, so we're saying this is wrong or at least imprecise. Yeah. So this is not really a consensus algorithm, right? um it's so when you use a consensus algorithm the problem is that anyone can speed a node and and even someone can speed like a thousand node right or or a million even and it's it's not that expensive and effectively like there is no need to have even a million node like you can just play smoke on mirrors and all point to the same machine at the end of the day and and this way you could make yourself much more important on the network that you're supposed to be, right? And so, so then we use stuff like proof of work and proof of stake um, to tie the node to some real resource that cannot be faked uh, so that someone cannot spin a bazillion gajillion nodes. Um, so that, which is what they do with the troll farm, right? I mean, that's, yeah, it's a symbol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's what they do. A troll farm, it might be one person who's running... 5,000 accounts and you think, oh, everybody thinks this way, but it's just one person and the accounts are free, right? So Exactly. Yeah. So that's the same, that's the same for, um, for Bitcoin nodes, right? And, and so you need a proof of something and then, well, we can go into the whole different kind of proof and, and why to use them or not. But uh, I think we already have like something quite heavy, but Let's say that with proof of stake, you always end up having the problem that it's always self-referential. Um, and, and so uh, with that come a lot of problems, um, let's say. <laughs> like that, that could be a show in, in, you know, in and of itself um, of like even several hours. Uh, there's, there is a lot to say there. And so I think we could just like limit ourselves to say, all right, at some point you need something that comes from outside of the system um, and, and proof of work does that. So to make a Bitcoin network work, you need a consensus algorithm, but that's only half the problem. Um, I mean, there are a lot of other problems, but the other problem are kind of been solved for a long time, like digital signatures and all of that have been solved for a very long time. But the second half of the problem is that you need to make this consensus available to everybody. To, to see what it is, right? Uh, because same thing, like before Nakamoto consensus, we actually had what is now called classical consensus algorithm. Uh, before they were just like consensus algorithm, but you know, Satoshi kind of like throw a wrench in there. So now they call them, we call them classical. Um, and those are algorithms, I think the most well-known is Paxos. Uh, and most of them are actually like derivative of Paxos, like variation around Paxos. And, and the reason you can make a, you cannot make a cryptocurrency with that is that you need to know the set of participants ahead of time, right? So it cannot be permissionless. Um, 
and they scale very poorly to a large number of participants, right? But for instance, um, the, the CDBC project Hamilton doesn't use Nakamoto consensus. It uses a variation of Paxos. I can't recall the name right now, um, but it, it works right for them, right? Because they plan to have like, what, three to five data centers that are going to uh, get in consensus, something like that. And it's not like something is gonna someone is gonna show up out of nowhere to participate. So, um, so it works for them. Um, but nodes being able so when Satoshi says nodes can uh, leave and rejoin the network at will, and he's talking about people who are participating in the proof of work in the Nakamoto yeah. consensus, then the the he had to do something besides what was already out there because yeah we don't know we don't know who's going to jump on and start mining. Yes, and and this is. This is really a very important feature of the system, right? Because otherwise, I mean, otherwise you have a central bank effectively, right? <laughs> the set of the set of, of participants to the consensus algorithm are in the central bank. Um, so this is a very important characteristics of the system. And so Nakamoto consensus is very good at making it obvious what the consensus is to everybody. It's like you follow this chain of error and each error is 80 byte, right? So even if the chain is very long, it's, you know, on any small device, you can download the chain and verify. The computation to make it is very asymmetric, right? You need a lot of computation to create the chain, but verifying at least the error chain is very, very easy, very cheap. Um, so this way you can have device that interact with the network just following the main chain and and be able to know what the consensus is. The problem with Nakamoto consensus is that it's very slow to converge to any kind of decision. Um, because say on Bitcoin, you're gonna have one block every 10 minutes, but even when there is one block, you don't know that there is not like a second block that is going around at the same time, right? So before you're really sure, you always want to wait a few blocks. And so, you know, it's gonna be like 30 minutes, an hour, depends on the level of, of security you're looking for, but that's that's a consensus algorithm that's converging very slowly. And, and with that slow convergence come a whole lot of undesirable things. Uh, some of them fairly obvious, some of them not as obvious. Uh, the fairly obvious one is that, you know, most people prefer fast confirmation time uh, to slow confirmation time, right? Um, there is a time preference there. So that's, that's the very obvious one, but there are there are effect on scale, um, because so there is a very important characteristics, right? Because otherwise you'd be like, okay, well, let's just make the block time one minute or even like twenty seconds, and and then you know you converge much faster, um, and you can't do that. But the trade off that you're making is that you're not going to be able to scale if you do that, because one very important characteristic of Nakamoto consensus uh, with proof of work is that you want to have the time to that it takes to verify a block to be very small comparatively to the block time, like effectively negligible. Because so that's kind of something that Satoshi missed, but that was discovered later on um in in the selfish mining uh paper which is the second most cited paper after uh well after the bitcoin white paper in the cryptocurrency space that's really a paper that was extremely important and that paper shows that um there are mining strategy that if we allow an actor to have a weight more important than their share of the hash rate and the way it works to simplify a bit, the way it works is that they can adopt strategy that's going to increase their orphan rate, but increase other people's orphan rate even more than their own. So, right? when we so talk relative about or orphan rate, we're talking about you make a block, the network and it's not it, accepted by the network. It goes out. They 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 reject it for some one reason or another, right? So you yeah. wasted that energy, time, money now at this point. So that's in. Traditionally, we would not want our orphan rate to be high, but if we could get every make everybody else's just as high, then it's sort of equal. Well, even higher. That's even that's higher. the problem, right? Like the the problem is that you can increase your orphan rate while increasing the orphan rate of others even more. To do that, though, you need more than a third of the hash rate. So 
it's not that big of a problem um, as long as you have like you know sufficient diversification in the hash rate but it's still a problem when your verification time is long because when your verification time is long for blocks there is kind of like a non-voluntary form of this selfish mind process that start happening even if like nobody is doing it actively to be hostile actually if nobody has more than a third of a hash it's not beneficial to anyone um so this nevertheless is after, this is after we already so we've we've received a block it's been it's it's come to our node and now we're validating we're verifying that this, yeah. this is a valid block at this point so so this is the whole process like propagation plus verification because what's happening is that let's say you'll not find the block you're gonna start mining on top of it right away right because you build the block yourself you know that it's valid and you don't need to propagate it to yourself you <laughs> and so and so you're gonna mine on top of it right away right but the other miner are still mining on top of the previous blocks and they will need to receive your block verify that your block is valid and then they can mine on top of it and during that time um you are doing something different and so if that time is negligible compared to the block time then for all intended purposes it doesn't change anything but if that time become non-negligible compared to the block time then all kind of negative um all kind of negative stuff happen like the, the incentive completely go out of whack so this is why a one minute or a two minute block time starts to get weird like as we make it well, less and less. You could do that, but you need to reduce the size of the block to, to very small blocks because okay. otherwise uh, you can keep the propagation time low enough. Okay, so so the yeah, so that's so that's an important part of this. That if we want to have big blocks, because this gets into the big block small thing, small block thing. If we want to mm -hmm. have blocks where we can have lots of transactions in them, we can't have small block times because or we can't have yeah. short block times because we get into this issue then because it's going to take us yeah. longer to validate the big block. Yeah. Also, it's not linear because there are costs that depend on the size of the block and there are costs that are fixed, right? Like the speed of the light is always going to be the same, right? So no matter how small the block is, at some point, I cannot get it faster, right? So if I, you could say, well, if I divide the block time by two, and I divide the size of the block by two, then I should be able to reach the same scale, right? And it should work just as well. No, because they are fixed cost. Um, and so, so the faster you go and, and the smaller the scale that, that you can reach. So we, so we are going to, okay. So that's a good, so that's a good place to start. And I think that this starts to get us into the problem up that is being addressed by the avalanche pre-consensus, right? So it's, it sounds like we've got two things on eCash. The pre-consensus, this one I understand pretty well. The post-consensus, I think that's going to be important for us to get into because this is where the biggest questions that people have had has, has been, right? Am I correct that addressing this, the fact that we have to have, whether it's 10 minutes or something in that range, if we want to be able to scale, uh, and yeah, you need something that is basically an eternity for computers. Okay, and, right. So and 10, ten minutes, minutes is, is, is... <laughs> yeah, that's a long time. <laughs> okay, so so we're so in some ways we're kind of stuck with this. At least as far as we can understand, right yeah. now we are stuck with this ten minutes. Um, so, but, but yeah, we... because Nakamoto consensus, like this is all Nakamoto consensus work. Right. right. And so um, you cannot change that camera. Like you can change that parameters, but you get like other things that go wrong. Right. Okay. So Nakamoto consensus is, is pretty slow by itself. And because it's pretty slow, the entropy in the network gets higher and higher. And then you need to produce a ton of work to actually like get that entropy sorted out. This is a good and, this is a good reframe. I had never heard anybody describe it that way, but yes, that's exactly that's exactly what's happening. So I, I mean, I guess for people who are unfamiliar with entropy, you're basically saying that it's like, you know, you've got a bunch of we've got this system and everybody's sort of getting ideas or getting information at a different time. And so what my information looks like and my neighbor and my 
all of that, the longer it goes on, the more differentiation there is between yeah. all of us. And that every 10 minutes we get back on track with everybody the same thing. But the longer it goes, the more different we're all going to think that the that yeah. reality is. Which is, yeah. I mean, that's, that makes sense. Like if you, I'm here on an island, right? It's like, if we all start out on this island back in the day and then some family leaves and they go on to another island, you know, two months from now, their culture will be probably pretty close. Two years from now, it might start to diverge. Two decades from now, we might be speaking different languages, right? When we yep. meet each other. So, and then we need to get, we have a family reunion. We get back on track. We all speak the same language. And this is kind of like the, the every block that's going to come in, right? Yeah. So every node is an island. Okay, so... But we don't want that. We we definitely want to have. What well, you kind of want that? Well, I mean, we <laughs> we don't want that as a user, right? I mean, we do want that in terms of Nakamoto consensus. But let's say I'm, you know, I'm a merchant. Yeah, but also you want that because you want anyone to be able to join the network, right? And have a good sense of where things are at, right? Okay. Because okay, on the other end, so let's let's. So far, we haven't gone into Avalanche at all, but Avalanche is more like the daily chit chat that, uh, you know, like like uh, an analogy that I came up with uh, recently was like, you know, if you want to share knowledge, like you can read books. And that's really the, the Natagamoto consensus uh, way of doing things. Like you have all the information in that books and you can read it and it's very dense. But but then you have Twitter, right, where everybody is exchanging like bribe of information all the time. And it's much faster. It's much quicker. But it's very hard to know what people were saying one year ago on Twitter. Like all of that is completely inaccessible, right? But but I can I can pick up a book from last year and read it and know what's up, right? Very good, very good point. Very good point. Okay, okay. So and 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 this I think will also end up uh, end up getting us into one of the things that people have presented because you know what I've heard over and over is, oh, well, if this avalanche thing works, why would we still want proof of work? And I think that you've made some good arguments of why we need it, but I want to kind of save that to the end because we need okay. to, yeah, yeah. let's, let's jump into, um, so let's talk about this, the avalanche pre, so we've got this idea of let's frame it. So make sure I understand this, right? Correct me where I'm wrong here. We've got an idea of avalanche pre-consensus, we have Nakamoto consensus, and then we have an avalanche post consensus. Do I kind of have this structure correct, or where am I wrong? Yeah, from, from a user perspective, very much. But the thing is, you can do post consensus by itself, but you cannot do pre consensus without post consensus. Got it. Okay. And, and one way you can think about it is that instead of thinking of post consensus as voting on the block, you can think of it as voting on the Coinbase which is okay. like the magic transaction of the block. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. So, right? so yeah. So let's, let's do this chronologically then. So let's talk about the, cause this was the initial introduction uh, to that. My initial introduction to avalanche on Bitcoin cash, when it was first being discussed, I think Chris Pacey has got a great paper. I'll link to that as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's very helpful for people to understand at least the history of how this started to be discussed. Um, and it's really dealing with, so, so as we said, we've got this 10 minute timestamp that, and, but we still want to wait for some blocks. So like people. Yeah. So may, may I, I, yeah, please, go ahead. I, I think I want to interject something here Please go ahead. Um, on, on this, like to completely state the problem, because there is one aspect that we didn't really expose, but we use a bunch of strategy that are kind of clunky to try to reduce the entropy on the network. And when we don't do that, then all kind of stuff get worse as well, right? And um, some of them are like, you know, um, um, all kind of policies like, like chain transaction limit or minimum fees or stuff like that, right? We kind of de facto decide that everybody will use the same value there as a policy, but you don't really want that, right? That, that kind of suck that this is the case um, because you would want those value to fluctuate, you know, based on the resources and the need um, uh, of the network and, and, you know, the capability to provide those, you know, like supply and demand and whatever. 
Um, the problem is that if you do that, then everybody starts using different value for those stuff. And then the entropy grows like exponentially faster. And so like even zero conf for this kind of stuff become completely unreliable, right? Like no, zero conf is not super secure, but good enough for many use cases in practice. But when you start to mess with those policy, even for those use cases where high degree of security is not required, even for those cases, it's, it's not even good enough anymore. Um, and, and then you're faced with two things. Either you start baking those policy in the consensus protocol, but that's a bad idea, I'd say. Like you want as little as possible as consensus rule in general. Or you need to resolve that. Like you need to, to have another way to keep the entropy low in that front. Okay, but go back. I just wanted to, to, okay. to put yeah. that one in there because it's, it's like, it's, it's the connective, like all those stuff that Avalanche um, uh, improved, they seem completely disconnected, but they are connected by, by that notion of entropy increasing um, between it. the nodes of the network. Got it. Okay. So, so as you said, so we use, uh, and, and have been on Bitcoin, uh, you can't really do it on BTC necessarily, uh, you know, in the wild because, you know, they've got a replace by fee thing. And I think people like mm -hmm. Hayden auto even showed that in Australia, some of the BTC, uh, payment processors that you could double spend them and do basically that you would be able to do a, a charge back, make your transaction disappear and steal goods from somebody. Um, but on BCH and eCash, and I mean, I've been building these systems so far. Now, mind you, we're not at, at the scale that we want to be at. So far, like you say, it's clunky, but from a, a risk standpoint, zero confirmation has been working. And I think that this is sort of the political argument from the people who are maybe not necessarily opposed to avalanche, but where there have been conflicts with particular people and teams in the space, right? To where this zero, zero confirmation works, zero confirmation works, this thing is fine, this thing works. Um, let's talk about why, why, it, why it doesn't work, because it's, it's, if, it, if it worked fine, then I guess there would be maybe a negligible reason for the, for, uh, avalanche pre-consensus, but let's talk about like, you, you gave a good example of why zero comp doesn't work because it has, it's reliant on these policies. Maybe you could talk about how avalanche solves that particular problem and what we could expect in terms of benefits. If, if this avalanche pre-consensus is, is put in, like, what does it solve? How does it change the experience of, of Bitcoin for people? Yeah. So well, as you mentioned, when you do a transaction, there are a set of policies that each node is going to apply to. Well, first, they're going to look if the transaction is valid or not, according to the consensus rules, right? And if the transaction is not valid according to the consensus rule, then nobody's going to accept it, uh, no matter what happens, right? Um, but if they are valid, uh, there are still a set of policies that, that you want to apply. Some of them is to are, are there to prevent Daniel of attack service. Some of them are um, um, well, most of them are actually Daniel of attack service. Uh, <laughs> um, Daniel of service attack. Um, but but the thing is, like the right value for those things, they are that you don't want them to be written in stone, right? Um, and and right now, you, you have two problems with that. So first, everybody needs to use the same value. And if some miner use different values or, or some merchant, actually, if some merchant use different value, they can be double spent. And if some miner use different value, they can allow anyone else to be double spent, right? And the problem with that is that the assumption that you make when you use Bitcoin is that the miner, as an aggregate, are honest, but you don't expect any one of them to be honest specifically, right? And, and if you had to do that, then, then there is a bit of a problem. But when you rely on zero conf on BCH or eCash, you effectively rely on the fact that all the miners are honest and are gonna use the same policies. So, so already like you are not in the same category of, of security at all, right? Um, you need just like one dishonest miner to allow a percentage of, of zero conf to be double spent. 
but so so that's one aspect right the security is way lower because of that but also you want to be able to change those parameter and today to change those parameter um, it's it's just as hard as a fork right even though there is no consensus for change uh, it's the same thing you need to have some kind of activation mechanism and make sure that everybody upgrades at the same time because if you don't do that then you're going to break zero off right and and so that prevents all kind of stuff like you know fee being very cheap when there is not a lot of use but if the system is congested then maybe fee could raise the you know dynamically in a way that is predictable for the users uh, all those kind of stuff they, they have no way to happen in a coordinated fashion that keeps your conf secure okay so so then uh here so here comes avalanche Here's so yeah so here come so avalanche right so what we do is that when i receive a transaction my node is going to start querying also node to know what they think about the transaction right and they're going to tell me either yeah for me it's a good transaction it respects my policies and everything i think we should include it or some other node are going to say well no and some other node are going to say well i don't care right um maybe because they haven't received that transaction yet and so they, they haven't you know <laughs> they haven't had an opportunity to to decide anything about it right and and then you have those this protocol that happens when you start pulling other nodes and if you see that most of the node that you pull disagree with you you're gonna flip your position right and also not are gonna be the same and you can prove that uh this is meta stable meaning that um even if you split the network 50 50 because you have randomization in the way that you pull the node there are going to be like a small shift that's going to happen one way or the other and any small difference is self-amplifying right so um very quickly you end up on one side or the other uh, the transaction is good or it's not good and typically it takes you know like a second two seconds something like that like almost never more than three seconds so and very very quickly network so everybody in the entire network yeah, yeah. will agree this is yeah. valid or or it's not valid within one to two yeah. seconds everybody all the nodes agree it's not this is valid or it is not valid because you don't know you don't need you don't need to pull other nodes to know if it is valid or not valid you can apply the consensus rule and know this is valid or not but it's like do we want of that or do we don't want of that so accepted or not accepted maybe might be a better term because yeah it's, so it's the, arbitrary right like it could go yeah. either yes or no uh there's no yeah so the, the term that we use is finalized okay finalized okay because yeah. because what happened is that when avalanche decide okay this transaction is finalized um what happened is that you cannot include a double span of that transaction in the block so a transaction that is not finalized can be included in a block by a miner later on if that miner wishes to do so if that transaction you know is good by their policy maybe they are not good for most people but you know they decide that this is good so so it doesn't mean that the transaction for which avalanche no is rejected it means that though you don't get that guarantee that it's not going to be double spent so that's interesting. That's and that, I think that's an important thing for people to understand is that avalanche is not so it doesn't have to go through a transaction doesn't have to go through this avalanche consensus necessarily in order for a miner to include it in a block. But hmm. if it does go through the process, well, a miner could also not include that in the block, right? So it could go through the yep. process and a miner could decide, okay, I still don't want to include it. But what they can't yep. do is they can't include a transaction that would be a double spend of that. So that yeah. would that would spend the same inputs. They yes. can't that can't now that can't be included into a block. Yeah. Okay. That's it. That's actually that's actually really important because it does say that okay, well, we're still really the validity is still Nakamoto consensus because a miner could just decide to include a transaction that nobody had ever seen. Like that could still happen. Right? Yeah. So, so the way the system is designed is that 
unless you're a miner, you can disregard that whole avalanche thing altogether. And you get basically the same thing as you get now. Okay, interesting. Interesting. So, so with the avalanche pre-consensus, a node wouldn't even have to recognize avalanche pre-consensus. Like they could just continue as they're doing everything and mm -hmm. it would be the same as they're experiencing it now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so they may have more work to do when a new block appear. Okay. Right. Because they may have drifted more from the state that everybody is in, right? Like maybe they accepted the double span of one of the transaction because they didn't know, but eventually the block is going to appear and, and, okay. and, you know, fix that for them. Right. So, so they are basically like a node that would ignore avalanche is in the same state as they are right now, effectively. So if let's so if let's say I am an exchange and I'm running a node that uh, has avalanche and I see a transaction uh, like right now, you know, maybe an exchange takes depending upon the currency, you know, it's going to take between three and sometimes 20 or 30 confirmations before they'll say, OK, we will accept this because they don't want to get double spent. Uh, what are the chances if they were to just accept this transaction, if they've got Avalanche, they're to accept this transaction, what are the chances that um, they would get double spent if they just accepted it with basically at this point, a zero confirmations Nakamoto consensus, right? But with the Avalanche, it's finalized. Um, yeah, they would, they would need, that? yeah, they would need to wait for Avalanche to say that it's finalized, but it's going to take, you know, seconds. Mm -hmm. And well, then they know it's not going to be double spent, right? So, so they are good. They're good. To, it, they don't necessarily know that it will be mined, but every I mean, well, eventually it, policy, it yeah, would eventually. be probably right. <laughs> yeah. If, I mean, the, the chances on that one is like, yeah, OK. Um, and, and, you know, if they want to make sure of that, they can, you know, like move the coin themselves with a higher fee transaction somewhere. Right. right? And so with child pay for, uh, child pay for parent, they, they effectively it. could guarantee that, you know, the whole stuff get mined. If, so, if they're worried about that. Okay. So I guess the other, and this comes up from, this is a weird one. Obviously for, for the consumer, for exchanges, for businesses, this is very preferable, right? This is very, very preferable. Now there are people within the space who they fetishize this idea of, you know, oh, well, what if someone presents a heavier chain, right? What if someone presents a heavier chain, then um, they're not able to, I guess, roll back the chain. They're not able to uh, reorg uh, this situation. Like it basically this, con this transaction now, even though it hasn't been mined is sort of, it's the, it's the, the finalization is the truth here. And that somehow overrides the proof of work. Uh, that somebody should be able to double spend it if they if the miner should be able to double spend it if they're if they've got the hash power why can't they double spend this thing what's the what's the argument to that idea well yeah i've i've heard that before but it always it always seemed kind of bizarre to me because the whole stuff is a mechanism through which you achieve a goal right um and and the goal is to make um a digital cash system effectively right um that you know doesn't rely on any third party and all of that like people can read the whole white paper if they want to to know the detail but the goal is not do whatever um was more shot right say you should do right like that's not like that's that's never been the goal right like the, and this is a stupid goal in my opinion that makes no sense whatsoever um the hash rate like we throw resources in there it's for a reason right we need to make sure that it serves the purpose that it's serving and if it's doing something else then we should not be throwing resources in it this is a good point yeah that's and that is that is exactly what i see as being lost in that discussion is aren't we talking about that we want to make a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system? Like that's what the, the point is here. What's this idea of here? Somebody puts in, sends a valid transaction to the network. And then all of a sudden we're going to, 
do something other than that transaction. It seems very strange. It's definitely an out, outlier situation. I mean, I guess the only... So here's... So here's what? It happened when, when we forked uh, eCash, right? Go on. Go on. Explain that, please. Well, so Miner uh, decided to effectively like mine a chain with none of the transactions that were... Um, like none of the transactions that user of the network decided to... There were some transactions in those blocks, but I don't know where they came from. Um, they were they were not the one of people wanted to use the chain. Um, and those blocks, they have no value to the network, right? Um, so so there is no reason that the network should accept those. Like, like not just accept those, but pay for those, right? Like minor are remunerated for their work and, and they should be, right? Because they put resources, but at the same time, like the work needs to provide value or, or you don't want to be paying for it. Well, because at the, the, the other aspect of that is here's a miner who's mining empty blocks or relatively empty blocks. Most of them were empty. A miner who's purposely trying to make the network unusable to others. But at the same time, there are other miners who are mining every time who are mining on top of that block. So they're doing the work. But what's yeah, and they're losing of, money because yeah, of this. Money. Right, 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 right. So, so you want you want the people doing the good work to be rewarded for their good work, and you want the people not doing good work to not be rewarded for for their work, right? And and so you want the miner that mine valid transaction to be rewarded, and you want the miner that mine double spend to to not be. Though the thing is. Okay. If you go back to when Bitcoin came out, there was nothing else than Nakamoto consensus mm-hmm. out there, right? So, so you had no better way of making that decision than just pick the longest chain and hope for the best. Um, but no, we have a better way. So there is no reason not to use it. Okay, so who gets to participate? Maybe we should set that out as well, because I think that's important for both the pre and the post consensus. Mm-hmm. Uh, the avalanche. So obviously not every node, or maybe I'm wrong. Who, what, who gets to participate? What allows you to participate? Obviously, when you participate in Nakamoto consensus, you're doing that with hash rate. Not every node is a mining node. Um, which nodes get to participate? What are the rules under which they are allowed, the prerequisites that allow you to participate in the avalanche consensus? Yeah. So for avalanche, you need to produce a proof that you own some coins and those coins need to be like old enough and there, there are a few characteristics, right? But effectively, you need to prove that you own coins and the more coins that you own and the more weight you will have. So people people call this, I mean, that's that sounds effectively like proof of stake. Is it, is it this is proof of, proof of stake. Yeah, yeah. This is a great to call it proof of stake, though. Like this is this is why this whole combination of proof of work and proof of stake, I think, is such a dangerous mem. Because it's true, but it doesn't mean what people think it means. Because proof of stake is, uh, as people understand it, is a way of deciding who gets to pick the next block. Basically, it's a it's a yeah. mechanism to that. But this isn't doing that. This is not Nakamoto consensus with. You know, people signing block with stake okay. uh, to choose what you know chain is heavier. This is more. Um, this is just that you can't participate in this other consensus. Basically, figuring out what's finalized and what's not finalized. You can't participate in that unless you could prove to everybody else that you have skin in the game. Yeah. Okay. So, and also the thing is, you know, it's kind of nice because if you want to screw up with the system, you need to make everybody rich in the process. Right. <laughs> well, right? And, and they have to have, well, the other thing about it is that they have to have age, right? So you have to buy these coins and then you're going to have yeah. to sit on them. Yeah. So you can't just do it like right now. Like if you decide, hey, okay, I want to just get the stake right now and then you get them that's still that's not going to get you in right like you're going to have to wait at least so how long is the wait how long or or can you give us some idea of like the coin age what this is yeah so i think right now uh in the code it's too weak if i remember properly uh but 
you know, like depending on what we see, we can change those value. Uh, one, one cool stuff, you know, one big difference between Avalanche and, and, and you know, Nakamoto style consensus is that all the Avalanche nodes don't need to agree on all the parameters. And as a result, it's, it's, it's much easier to change, you know, like Azure policies, like, like, you know, the, the longest chain that you accept or the minimum fee or whatever, uh, but, uh, but even parameter of the, of the avalanche consensus itself, right? Like if we notice that two weeks is a bit too short, we can release a version of the nodes that say, okay, no, it's two months, say, and, and, and that specific node is going to be much more selective about who it pulls. And as everybody upgrades, like the, the network as a whole becomes more and more selective. Interesting. Interesting. So you can you can almost have multiple multiple uh, different consensus networks, I guess we could almost call it, but multiple different pools of consensus happening depending upon the policy. They are going to be the same, right? If they are completely okay. disconnected, then then you start to have problems. Okay, got it, got it. <laughs> but but um, as long as there is sufficient overlap, then then you're good. Got it. Okay. Uh, okay. So. So, so we've talked about pre-consensus. This is getting us the finalization of transactions, and then those transactions can't be double spent in the Nakamoto consensus in the mining of the mm -hmm. blocks. This part I understood. Like this part I understood kind of going into this. What's been new for me, and so what, what this will be education for me, is this idea of post-consensus. So what's the, so I think we understand the and you say they're connected, so that's important. Mm -hmm. I don't want to. I don't want to drop these as they're two different things. What is the problem? So I guess we understand the problem with the pre-consensus. We've got an issue with uh, instant finalization of transactions. Zero conf is clunky. We'd like to get to something that's a, a little more uh, elegant and that that is going to give us some additional features on this. Would be cool if we could start to get to a situation where exchanges could. Uh, immediately accept transactions without asking for all kinds of confirmations. It starts to get us to a cool place. Okay. Yeah, so and, and there is more. There, like, wait a There is more because now when you receive a block, you have a pretty good idea of what is in there, right? Which means that validation is like pretty much already done. And so right now there are limits that come from the fact that you don't want the entropy to grow high. And one of them uh, that have been a recurring discussion is the, the chain transaction limit, right? So right now, you know, like I send the transaction to you and you send that transaction to someone else and so on. At some point, you cannot send the coin anymore until a block is found, right? And the reason why there is a limit for that is that, if say when the block falls, the first transaction end up being uh, you know invalidated and and some conflicted transaction is mine, then I have to go down the whole chain and fix up everything and maintain like all the state that I calculated and the dependent fee and all the transaction and whatnot, right? Like there is a very complicated computation that needs to happen, and that comp that computation is inherently quadratic in the size of the chain. So you don't want the chain to get too long right um and the reason is is because you know the mess can grow and grow and grow for 10 minutes until you find the block but effectively with like when you can reconciliate that state very quickly the transaction limit only makes sense for transactions that have not been finalized right because the one that have been finalized they are not going to be double spent so you're not going to end up in that situation where you need to double spend them and redo the whole computation and whatnot right so there are a lot of stuff um, that are maybe not so obvious, but that, that are also, you know, emerging from the fact that in a Nakamoto consensus network, entropy can get pretty high, and 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 you need to keep that into so so under are, control. So so would fi would a finalized chain of unconfirmed transactions then not be subject to the to the limit? Would it not need to be said? No, yeah, there's no problem with those. They okay. can get as long as we want. Okay, so it is the solution. Because you know that the chain is okay. like, the problem with the chain of unconfirmed transaction is that it can be invalidated at any yes. point. And when that happens, you have a, a computation to do that, that, you know, the longer the chain and the more computation you have to do. 
So, um, so this is a solution to, so that's interesting. I didn't, I hadn't really thought about or realized that. So avalanche pre-consensus is ostensibly it's a solution to the transaction, like a real solution to yeah. the unconfirmed transaction chain limit. Yeah, and, okay. and there are a bunch of other weird problems like that that don't seem like they would be related, but that are actually um, um, like stemming from the same root cause. And, and and this is why it's so complicated to talk about it because right. why would like instant confirmation change scaling and change the transaction limit and, and right. you know make 51% attack harder and whatever. Like, all of that doesn't seem connected at all. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's which is which is why I'm glad that we're having this conversation, and I, and and I think that it'll help to open people's minds and to realize. And you know, there's also something to. There's been an unfortunate meme. You know, it was uh, you know, the BSV people and Craig Wright and that, that somehow a meme got into the space that Bitcoin was somehow perfect from the beginning when Nakamoto with when Satoshi Nakamoto dropped the code that it was absolutely perfect and it could work perfectly for everything and there would be no problems that he foresaw everything and all of this sort of idea which is absurd to anybody who's an actual engineer right that uh and would be absurd yeah, to plus itself. it's unnecessary right like the achievement is already huge I mean, the, the number of things that he foresaw is incredible already, right? And, and th there is no, like, it, it's not putting the thing down than to know, like, like then to know that whole space of, like, entrepreneur and engineer and whatnot in more than 10 years discovered one thing or two, you know, uh, versus one guy uh that worked on like we don't know how long but you know still that's a very good point like he like he discovers a <laughs> hundred things solves problems that nobody had ever solved in 10 years an entire space figures out a few additional things you know but still it's like yeah it's incredible no i i totally agree i totally agree i think that it's a it's a it's a dumb meme it's not and it's not necessary it doesn't in no way does yeah and, and we know that it's not true like there are obviously stuff in the original bitcoin client that we are broken and we know that and satoshi himself says as much in in his early writings of right course. like he, of, of he recognized that some of the stuff that so what engineer what engineer would say oh it's perfect no bugs i've i've seen everything yeah. it does it's just not it's not <laughs> something somebody would say okay so Okay, so we've got this pre-consensus idea. So let's talk about how this idea of post-consensus comes around. My understanding is that at least some of this stems from out of that attack that you discussed um, a little earlier in this conversation. I called it the psycho ex-girlfriend attack. It was the when the split of uh, eCash and Bitcoin Cash happened. Is that right? That at least some of the insights about why this is needed came from out of that and how you... Um... So yes and no, that was, you know, that was a real life confirmation that this is needed, but we knew before that, that it was needed. And, and there is probably a more straightforward reason for that um, is that if you want to prevent block that have double spend um, of transactions that are finalized by Avalanche, you need to have a way to reject those blocks. And you cannot do that based on the decision of Nakamoto consensus because not a common to consensus doesn't have that information, right? So at some point, you want to have a mechanism that is based on that, that is able to break those blocks. You cannot do, you can do post consensus by itself, but you cannot do pre consensus without post consensus because of that. Okay, so let me just, so let me see if I can break this down. So basically we've got a situation, so this would be an example. So we've got a situation where we finalize the transaction, so this transaction cannot be double spent. And then a miner comes along and it's just pure Nakamoto consensus. And they've got a transaction that double spends this finalized transaction in there. If we don't have some other mechanism, nobody will reject that block. They'll just accept the yeah. block. And then what's the reason for the pre-consensus in the first place? Yeah, exactly. Failed, right? Like what, why, there, why did we even finalize <laughs> it? So it's like, exactly. it's one of these, which has always been interesting to me that one of the, that the, 
suggest or or the um what what would i say the proposals for how do we solve this issue that have seemed that are being carried on in bch that i have never found uh i've never found convincing are things like double spend proofs things that are just like messages to the nodes to say like ah well something bad may be happening but it really doesn't address this idea of okay here it's been double spent how do we reject the block so so let's talk a little bit about how that mechanism works that this block would be rejected so i've got a I've got a block that comes in. It's got a double spend, a, a transaction that's in conflict with this finalized transaction. What happens then? So what happens is like very specifically, the the node, like it's important to consider that each node has a subjective view of the world, right? So I can explain like what happens, like what each node does, and then there is an effect on the network. But so so if your node has finalized some transaction and then receive a block that double spend that transaction, the node is gonna park the block. We call it park because the, the block is not invalid. It respects the consensus rules and everything that in some circumstance that could be a valid block, but you park it, meaning that you put it on the side, you don't like connect it to, to the chain that you consider as valid. Um, because for you, it's double spending some transaction that have been finalized by Avalanche, right? And you start that Avalanche process again with other nodes for that block, right? And, and if all the other nodes are telling you, no, you are wrong, this block is actually good, um, then you're going to connect it back to your chain. But um, if the majority of the nodes are honest the, and, and you finalize that transaction, they're going to say no as well. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. That actually makes, a, that makes a lot of sense. So you, so you don't just throw it away on, on, off the jump. You don't throw it away. You just say, you then do this again and you pull. Mm -hmm. because, so there is still this chance that for whatever reason, I guess there's enough uh, nodes on the network with enough stake and they all say, no, 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 actually it's good. For so so one, of, one of the problem is that all of that is highly concurrent. Okay. Right, so the transaction can be emitted and the block in which it appears can be like mined almost at the same time and, and some not are gonna finalize, some not are not gonna finalize, right? And so, so if you finalize the transaction, like the network should say no to the block. And and if it doesn't, it's because like the, there is a majority of, of nodes that are uh, hostile. But the, the reverse case, however, is completely possible. It's that you haven't finalized the transaction yet, but maybe you also not already have, right? But for you, the process has not finished yet. So you receive the block. And so for you, you don't need to reject that block yet, right? Because for you, that transaction is not final yet. And... In that case, you know, you need to pull the other nodes on the network and other nodes on the network may be pulling you and you're going to say, yes, I consider that block to be valid. But also nodes are going to tell you, well, no, this block, you know, double spends a transaction, so it's not valid. And, and the same way as it converges for transaction, it, it, it converges for blocks. Got it. So, so now I understand why you said that they're not two separate things. Now, I, now I'm understanding why you're saying that it's one whole process of coming to consensus because you have to you have to have both they yeah. have to both be there but you don't have to have both you can have just post consensus right right but, but you but cannot have you, but why would you do that why would you have just post consensus what would be well we're gonna roll first post consensus uh the reason is because you can have just post consensus oh, right itself, so right. <laughs> you don't want to roll everything at once uh you got want it. to limit the risk uh <laughs> Got it. So, Got so it. we're gonna roll out uh, post consensus at first, and you will see how everything goes, and 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 then move toward the uh, rolling out pre consensus. Because there's a lot less risk. Of, yeah, you'll be you'll be able to see everything that's happening. I mean, there are a lot of little risk. There are a lot of less problem. Like first, there are much less blocks than there are transactions. Right. Right. So in terms of volumes of things that you need to do, it's much smaller. Right. So. 
um, there is much less of an optimization problem there. Mm -hmm. So then if the implementation is, is not as efficient, then you know it gives you a good idea to know actually what is efficient, what is not. And you have just one vote every 10 minutes on average. Um, you can already get some value out of it, but the biggest value that you get out of it is that you can get the cut in production and see what happens, right? right? Good. Okay. So, the, well, this is going to bring us to the question that, so this is, first off, this has been great. So this now I understand this much, much better. I understand the why much, much better. What always comes up always, this is interesting. It will, at least among engineers, right. And it my and myself, I think this was my big hang up as well is this question of, okay, I will accept that avalanche consensus works. Right. I'll be like, okay, Avalanche Consensus Works looks good. I'm looking at it all, makes sense, pretty straightforward, not a ton of moving parts on this thing. Um, so then, why, if Avalanche Consensus Works, should we keep Nakamoto Consensus then? Why don't, is it, isn't the risk, this is what everybody says, well, isn't this just introducing the thing that's going to replace Nakamoto Consensus and then it won't be Bitcoin anymore? And this is the big, like, moral hazard, it, as, as it were. What is, so, so why why is that yeah. not a worry? What or is it a worry? I mean, it really depends what you want out of the system, the properties that you want. Like you can build you can build the system using only avalanche consensus, right? And this is what Avax is doing. Um, the problem with that is that there is no way for new participants that connect to the network to know the current state of the network. Why is that? Well, because who are you going to ask? Right. So there is no, there is no. Because you don't know who has a stake, right? Right. So you don't know who are the avalanche nodes. So you don't know who to ask, right? There, there's, there is no bootstrap mechanism possible using only avalanche. And, and effectively what the AVAX people do is that they bite the bullet and they say, well, the initialization process is actually not trustless. So they actually say that it's not trustless. When so when yeah, I this like this is how it works, trustless. and this is the the this is the trade off that they are making. Like everything after that is trustless, but this part is not trustless. There is no way to bootstrap you on the network in the trustless manner. So they have a what they have some sort of central authority that they provide, and that gives you the current state of the network, and then you continue yeah. on from there. Really? Yeah. There there is uh, yeah there there is a set of like blessed. Uh, node, if you want, that's going to give you the list of validator, and then you can run from there. That doesn't seem like it solves the problem. I mean, am I missing something? That doesn't seem like it solves the problem that we're trying to solve, of having like a trustless, permissionless, peer-to-peer -peer network. Yeah, so I think that's a problem. So that's why I don't want to get rid of Nakano consensus. <laughs> Got it. Okay, so, so then maybe you could describe... How Nakamoto can, I mean, I'm sure there are people, if people have taken Bitcoin, my Bitcoin mystery school, if people are more technical, they understand, but maybe even just for, even for those people. And since we're in this conversation, how, how does Nakamoto consensus give us this bootstrapping ability, this ability for me, knowing nothing to start my node up and to know that what I'm looking at right now, once I'm all synced up is the, the current state of the network as it as it relates to Nakamoto consensus? So if we want to be strict, you can't know like 100%, but you can know like 99 point something percent, right? Um, the way you're gonna do that is by following the chain of headers and following the chain of headers that you know have valid block attached to them, that is the longest. And by the longest, we mean the one that have the most work in it. So the heaviest maybe is, uh, is a better way to state it. So you're gonna follow the heaviest chain. And what you know is that it costs resources to create the chain and, and the heavier the chain is and the more resources have been put in it, right? So once you have the heaviest tip of the chain that is considered valid by your consensus rule, you know that this is the chain that people have put the most resources in. Right, so either this is the valid chain that everybody accepts, or someone is paying a lot of money to keep you fooled and have to continue paying consistently to keep you fooled. And as soon as they stop, you're gonna notice that they fooled you, right? And and so, 
So the the bet that is if anybody do that or if they do that, they are not going to be able to sustain that for very long. Okay, so I've heard you describe this describe this as the the archival property that we get with uh, with Nakamoto consensus that we have this idea that this is how we can know what the history is. So we can, as Satoshi Nakamoto yeah. says, we can leave and rejoin the network at will. Yeah, not just the history, but most importantly, the current state of the current system. State. And the way we know it is by replaying the whole history. But right. I don't know that the history is the most important part. I'd say the the, the state at the end is really the right. most important so, part. So it's related in that way that we have to, yeah. to get to the current state. We get that by replaying the history. And we're doing that with Nakamoto consensus. So yeah. there's so and, and I think this is interesting and people I, you know, people who don't run their own nodes or maybe even some who do, but uh, who have never really watched the console as it's happening, maybe don't understand that we we in a way are when we sync our nodes are replaying the entire history of the Nakamoto consensus itself. Yeah. Uh, so we're participating in Nakamoto consensus, as it were, even for things in 2009, 2010, 2011, as it rolls through yep. our nodes. Yeah. So, but Avalanche only really presents us with, it's a consensus mechanism in the moment. It, it's live. There is no record. Live. Yeah. Live. There, there, is no, there is no trace of it. Okay. It's so it's a lot. It's, it's what we agree on live. And now I see why you said that it's and, like and, Live is an important word here because, um, it, like, it's actually a technical term in consensus algorithm. There, there are different properties that you want from the consensus algorithm. One of them is liveness. And liveness is the capability to, like, disconnect from the rest of, you know, the participants and reconnect later and, and reconciliate states. And uh, Avalanche doesn't have liveness property right because it's live maybe you know it shouldn't be called liveness but uh like it happened live right and after it happened it's not there anymore right there is there is not so if you were not there to see it happen uh you gotta trust someone else who was there like it's it's too late for you um but one of like so that's a reason to keep Nakamoto consensus is that Nakamoto consensus has this like property uh, where you can be like let's say there is a huge internet outage and and half of the world become disconnected from the other half right like say there is like Europe and the US and whatever and and China and and Russia like the the internet and the completely disconnected between the two well. So you would have Bitcoin going on on both sides, right? And when you reconnect, one of those chains is going to be longer, most likely the one in Russia and China. <laughs> and, and everybody's going to feed back to that chain, right? Whereas with Avalanche, if that were to happen, no, you have two Avalanche network and they have no way to get back with each other and, and know what's right or what's wrong, right? No, you have like two to Avalanche network permanently. Though it's not the case for us, right? Because every time a new block is found, you get a round of Avalanche on that block. So if you were to separate the network in two, you would have two chain and then you recognize, you reconnect and the block are gonna, the, the nodes are gonna start sending block to each other and they are gonna run Avalanche on those blocks. And one of the sites is going to have to invalidate all that state and, and adopt the other one. Eventually. So I, this is also very important. So there is not a functionally, there is not a record of what was de like specifically what was decided with Avalanche, except for like, we don't necessarily know which blocks were finalized and which blocks just were, or which transactions were finalized and which transactions no, and just made it into a block somehow. And, yeah, and even more weird, you know, you know, as a property of the protocol that if the node operate properly, they're going to finalize the same transactions. Right. You don't know that they're going to do it at the same time or in the same order. Got it. So, right? does, so does a... maybe there are two transactions. I'm going to finalize one 
and then the other, and you're gonna find an, find out his name oh. in, in the other way around, right? Oh, that's there is no absolute ordering of of the decisions. That's interesting. Okay. The only thing that I know is that if I finalize that transaction, and you are honest, you are eventually gonna finalize it as well. I don't know that you have now, and I don't know when you will, but I follow the of the protocol. So is every does every transaction? I guess this is another thing that's coming up for me. Does every transaction that um, is seen? So every transaction that is broadcast onto the network, will that become subject to the avalanche pre-consensus? So will it be every single transaction that a node sees? Will it eventually, will, will it go through a round of avalanche for finalization? Well, it needs to be valid. Okay. Right? So long as um, it's valid. I'm assuming a valid one <laughs> here, right? I'm yeah, assuming yeah, yeah. something that makes it into a mempool on, of a miner. So it needs to be valid. And uh, if you have a conflict set that is too big, like we're not going to pull the whole conflict set, mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise, like I spend the same coin 10,000 times and force everybody to vote right. like an absurd number of transactions. Right. Um, but what's going to happen is that, well, one of the transactions from that set is going to be decided on. Okay. And if the decision is yes, then you can throw up throw away everything else in the set right? right but if the decision is no then you can move on to the next one right okay okay that makes sense yeah this is okay super interesting super interesting and i think this is going to this is going to end up helping a lot of people to understand um so you said first is post consensus and then you'll check that out six months, a year, something like that. And then you'll go pre-consensus. What's the timing on this? When can people expect to start seeing this stuff on the network? Yeah, so the um, we have an implementation of post-consensus now that is, I mean, I want to say complete, but you know, we are verifying that. <laughs> like right, right now we are verifying that, right? So that is like presumably complete or tentatively complete or something like that. Like we have all the pieces, but we want to check out, you know, everything as, as we can. And when we're happy uh, that this is solid enough, uh, we're going to start rolling out post-consensus and, and start working on pre-consensus. But post-consensus is like very, very close. Um, it's 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 almost there so november do you think we could see it in november oh uh, we're gonna see post consensus before november before november okay yeah yeah yeah. cool cool so so it doesn't uh this is something that can just be because it's the post consensus this can just be rolled out uh in an upgrade this this doesn't require a hard fork or anything like that this does not require a fork of any kind i know okay and and pre-consensus does that require a fork either no no. So, so that's also important to know. So even nodes that let's say they didn't upgrade, they won't fall out of consensus with the nodes that, that do that upgrade necessarily. I mean, if it's just a, yeah. a, the, the avalanche, they won't fall out of consensus with them. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a very, that's a very important design decision that I've been made for a few reasons. Like one, there are a, lot of, a ton of software out there that is made to work with Bitcoin or Bitcoin derivatives. And we want all of that to keep working, right? Um, so all that software is going to keep working with, you know, like the minor tweak to support one chain or the other, but we don't want, you know, we don't want there to be any heavy lifting um, to be able to do that. Um, so so that's, that's an important aspect. The second important aspect is that if this is go wrong, we can pull the plug, right? <laughs> Uh, hopefully this won't go wrong and, and we are doing, you know, as much as we can, uh, so that it doesn't go wrong and, and we're kept quite careful about what we're doing, but you never know. Right. And, and the good thing is that the worst that can happen if we completely screw that up is that we pull the plug and we have what we have now. Right. 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 And, and the system is designed that way on purpose. Like, it's it's um it's 100 percent compatible with you know the way a bitcoin system works uh, for that reason got it well this has been uh this has been great 
super helpful for me. I, I learned a lot and now I feel like I can, I can speak to people about this when they have their questions. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this, looking forward to working on, working on eCash. Um, there's a May upgrade coming. Maybe is, is there anything that people should know in this May upgrade that's important? There is nothing very important. Let's okay. say like there are a few like technical stuff, but um, nothing of, of great importance okay. in there. I'm which afraid. is good. <laughs> which is good. So eCash. So eCash rolls along uh, and it's doing its thing. Uh, no, I appreciate this. I'm Oisa Shea. Thank you very much. This has been um, very very educational, and uh, I guess people can uh, where where where's the best? Is it Twitter? Is that the best place if people want to like? ping you or whatever is there a better way of doing it um yeah tw twitter is a good way um if you want me to notice your ping you're gonna have to follow me because i've muted um <laughs> i've muted all the notification from anyone that doesn't follow me because it was just getting too much uh <laughs> so so if you want me to notice uh to notice like whatever you're saying you're gonna have to you're gonna have to to follow but yeah i'm, I'm reachable there uh otherwise there are like values development group for ecash um for for more like ecash specific stuff because like my my personal twitter account is very much my personal twitter account i, I speak about a bunch of things that are of interest to me um the, the common thread is that those are things that are of interest to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you're going to hear about eCash, but you're going to hear about like run politics. You're going to hear about music. You're going to hear about like whatever is of interest to me. Um, if you want to hear about eCash specifically, there is a, there is an eCash, uh, I think it's eCash official uh, Twitter account mm -hmm. that is managed by our team. Um, so, so if you want like more specific uh, eCash news, maybe that's a, that's a better place. Yeah, I'll put those in. I'll put those links in the um, in the description. All right, man. I appreciate it. I know it's, yeah. it's morning for me. I know it's evening for you. I appreciate you doing this as yeah. as, as you did. But uh, I'll let you get to it. This is super helpful. Um, I'm sure we'll be talking about some other things again in the future. I always enjoy speaking with you. So, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, me too. Yeah, and I will talk to you soon. Ciao, ciao, ciao.